carried that tonight. Thank you. Sweet time of worship. Thank you, guys. Well, in honor of Thanksgiving, nobody come to Encounter Service Night, uh, we're going to uh, skip announcements and offering and just jump right into the teaching. Um, this, uh, this week, uh, our family's been in Arkansas um, with uh, Amy's family, and that's been awesome, been very relaxing. We sat around, I watched both Home Alone 1 and 2 and Elf all in the same day or day and a half, so... I mean, you know you're sitting next to a TV and chilling when that happens. So time's out on the four-wheeler and campfire times and a lot of food. So, um, well, I'm going to jump in, and uh, we're going to do tonight, we're doing Psalm 80 and Psalm 83. Um, and so, Father, we just ask you to anoint your word and let it minister to us tonight richly in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> yeah, amen. Watch out, there's a dip over there. Um, so Psalm uh, 80 and 83, this is session 35 in our uh, series on the 150 chapters on the end times. And both of these Psalms, 80 and 83, are about the Great Tribulation. In fact, it's pretty much the same theme. Uh, if you're reading Psalm 80 and 83, you are looking at all the same major components. Uh, the story's told just a little bit differently, <clears throat> but it's the same theme in both of these Psalms. And it's for Israel's deliverance in the midst of the Great Tribulation. So... Uh, that's kind of the primary. Get a little bit more specific on uh, Psalm 80. It's about Israel recounting God's intimate involvement in the forming and the tending to of Israel in its formation as a young sapling in need of his care. That's kind of the picture. <clears throat> but there have been many that have come against her and are threatening her continued existence. Psalm 83, it's primarily a call for justice as Israel's crying out for judgment against her enemies that have been so mistreating her. And she calls for God to deal swiftly with the nations that have sought to destroy her. <clears throat> Part C, if you're uh, here in the notes, they're being passed out. Um, uh, letter C, <clears throat> these are all Psalms of Asaph. So the book of Psalms is divided up into different clusters. A lot of the Psalms are by David, <clears throat> a couple in there by Moses. Uh, well, this is a grouping of 11 psalms, Psalm 73 through Psalm 83, so we're finishing up the, the, uh, the psalms of Asaph. I could have given you this bit of information, you know, a number of sessions ago, but I didn't. <clears throat> uh, these are 11 psalms that are written by As Asaph, and Asaph, if you remember, is one of uh, David's top guys, so he's got his top guys in the army, <clears throat> and then he's got his top guys that are running the new priesthood that he put into place. And the three top guys are Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun. And all of them uh, were songwriters and uh, were, uh, were leaders of choirs in <clears throat> David's tabernacle. And uh, so here's Asaph uh, writing both of the psalms that we're looking at tonight and this cluster uh, of these uh, uh, 11 psalms, again, Psalm 73 through Psalm 83. <clears throat> and all of Asaph's psalms have a common theme, all of them. And that is God's rule over his people Israel and over the nations. And that's a, uh, a helpful pairing because not every um, author that understood God's leadership for Israel understood God's future leadership over all the nations. But Asaph did, and you can see that in his Psalms because it comes out in, I think, all of them. All right, well, we're going to read Psalm 80 here. And so I just want to remind you as we read Psalm 80... We're reading the word of God. There's power on the word. There's power to heal and deliver and convict. There's power to break off chains as it's read. It's the word of God. And so as I read Psalm 80, I just want you to remember, this is a part of the tradition of Christianity. The word of God being read aloud. The Psalms being preserved for all the generations of Christendom. And this is just a beautiful thing. So we're just going to read this tonight. Psalm 80, I'm going to read 1 through 19. Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth between Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Awaken your might. Come and save us. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. How long, Lord God Almighty, will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You've fed them with the bread of tears. You've made them drink 
tears by the bowlful. <clears throat> You've made us an object of derision to our neighbors and our enemies mock us. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by may pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it, and insects from the fields feed on it. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your hand, your right hand has planted. The sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down. It's burned with fire. At your rebuke, the peoples perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man that you've raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and we will call on your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. The language here kind of goes, uh, dips a little bit into messianic prophecy in a very uh, you know, clear way, but it still then ties into this son at the right hand is Israel, but then it's also the son at the right hand is Jesus, you know, the, the coming Messiah. <clears throat> so we'll look at a couple of those themes as we get to it uh, here in a minute. But here we have Israel giving out a heart cry in her greatest time of testing and trial. Uh, this has been a psalm that has had value, uh, I mean, every day, always, but has had specific value at a number of uh, painful moments in Israel's history. So you can see kind of the, the theme of the psalm is really it's written from a time of pain and agony, most specifically the future great tribulation, her greatest trial. And she's reminding God, this is Israel reminding God who he is to her. Here a shepherd of Israel, not just good shepherd, not just God in heaven, but shepherd of this nation, which is in great uh, uh, you know, um, pain. You who've led Joseph like a flock, come and help us now. You who sit enthroned between the cherubim. He's being, this is God being reminded, you know, the psalmist, and really it's the position of, uh, written from the position of Israel, reminding God that he's God and reminding Israel that he's God. And remembering who he is, you're the one that's seated between the cherubim. We know who you are. This is a, a, a common theme that uh, God would be seen as seated between the cherubim. I gave you a, a passage in Isaiah as well as another psalm that says it similarly. <clears throat> Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. So this is Isaiah writing in a time of trouble. And he's reminding God, hey, you're not just God of Israel. You're God over all those nations that are beating on us right now. So God, show up, you who are enthroned between the cherubim. Psalm 99 says it similarly. The Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. See this connection between where God's seated in heaven, between the cherubim, and that being the seat that rules all the nations. And so therefore, from that place, he is in full authority and power over all the nations. I don't know if you uh, saw it in there, but it says in uh, Psalm 80, verse 1, so we're looking at Psalm 80 right now. In verse 1, it says, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Just if this is something that's a little bit new to you, that's a way that is frequently used to talk about the whole of Israel. Uh, Benjamin is the smallest tribe geographically. Um, Manasseh is the largest tribe geographically. In fact, Manasseh got two portions. And then Ephraim's in the middle. So this is kind of like being able to say from sea to shining sea or from the least to the greatest. This is a way to talk about uh, Israel as kind of like a whole entity by only mentioning three tribes. And it's used a number of times in the scripture that that specific three uh, tribe combo is order, in order to kind of describe all of Israel. All right, so then he says, awaken your might and come and save us. The us being Israel, the whole, the least to the greatest. Come and save us, awaken your might. God will respond to this cry in the midst of the great tribulation period. <clears throat> and to the millions that will be crying out for salvation in that hour, he will actually respond to this great cry. Now we're going to look at the next verse here, and it's actually, we're going to look at three verses. We're really going to look at verse 3, 7, and 19, because they all say the same thing, okay? And that is, make your face shine upon us. So here it is, uh, Psalm 83, 7, and 19. Restore us, O God, make your face shine upon us, that we may be saved. 
Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. Verse 19, restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. So here you have it at the beginning, in the middle, approximately, and at the end, this same cry, oh, restore us, restore us. It's the anthem. It's the, it's the theme of the psalm is restore us to our favored position with you. Restore us because right now we're getting beaten up and things are very difficult and we're not the Israel we're supposed to be. We're in a bad position. God, face your, uh, make your face shine upon us. God Almighty, Lord God Almighty. You see the progression? It, first it's, oh God. Then it's, oh God Almighty. Then it's, oh Lord God Almighty. This, this increased agony and pain as the psalm goes on, show up mightily on our behalf. Restore us. It's not just about deliverance. That's, you know, category one or, or step one. But after you've restored or after you've delivered us, then restore us to our favored position. Restore us to who we're supposed to be before you as your chosen people, as your favored nation, as the one that's been promised to rule, you know, it, uh, over all the nations under your care. And so that's the, the cry here of Psalm 80. Well, look at this. There's some ownership taken. I appreciate it when we see this in the Psalms. The reason I appreciate it isn't because I think that Israel needs to take responsibility. I appreciate it because this is promising there will be a measure of understanding in the final generation that there is responsibility needing to be taken and a partnership between God and man, and in this particular case, Israel and man, the people of Israel. So here it says this in uh, verse uh, 5 through 6. Nope, verse 4. How long, Lord God Almighty, will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? And that is just really intense. Your anger smolder, not against the people, against the prayers. Like, God, how long are you going to hear our prayers? And at least the way that the psalmist is speaking about it, like your anger smolder against us because we're so out of sorts with you. We're in such a, a bad uh, relationship positionally with you right now that even our prayers are odious, that your anger is smoldering, smoldering against our prayers. How long will that be the case? Yet it's written from a place of contrition. Like, oh God, how long will this be the case? Don't let this be the case anymore. And there's this heartfelt cry for God to move on behalf of Israel. This is good instruction for us Gentiles. For us to be able to look at this and go, Oh, God, you have this long-standing, complex relationship with Israel, and you refuse to allow her to be anything less than what you've required of her. Even if she's not walking in her, uh, in her destiny, even if she's not walking these things out, oh, God, don't hold your anger against her, but instead raise her up, restore her to that position. So this is just, you know, some would look at Psalms like this and use it as like in the total opposite heart. Like they would look at this and go, yeah, you sure are mad at her. That's, that's the exact opposite of what's happening here. This is, this is this, the heart of God through Asaph going, I know you're mad at us because of the way that we've been responding to you. Please have mercy on us and oh, please awaken us that we wouldn't be that way. And also I'm one voice, Asaph singing it, I'm one voice saying, I get it. We need your help. We need your mercy. P forgive us. I mean, this is, this, the heart of this is actually God wanting to try to get Israel out of her stuckness, out of that position, and bring her back to her purpose, her, her restoring. Again, restore, restore, restore. We just looked at it. All right? <clears throat> Let's read the next couple of verses here. I, this is uh, Psalm 80, verse 5 through 6. And you see the similar language in a psalm we did a week or two ago, Psalm 79, verse 4. Let's just read um, 80, 5 through 6. You fed them with the bread of tears. You made them drink tears by the bullfill. You've made us an object of derision to our neighbors, and our enemies mock us. That God is the one that has positioned Israel this way. It's actually Israel that's the one that's positioned themselves this way. See, it's both. It's the ownership of Israel going, we put ourselves in this position, but it's also then the, the, the onus being put back on God as well. It's like, but you've permitted all this. Like you've helped set things behind the scenes for this to be this way. It says, you have fed Israel with the bread of tears, with, a, with difficulties, with great challenges. You have made us an object of derision to our neighbors. 
Even our neighbors mock us. We've looked at that theme in some other uh, sessions, so I won't spend a lot of time on it here. But just that idea that the neighbors of Israel, the the, uh, nations around Israel, are going to see how forgotten Israel looks to to God, to the nations, to whoever, that they've been an object of derision. They're being mocked by their enemies. You who say that your your God is the Lord, where is he? You know, you who, you know, have said that you've been, you know, invincible throughout these last this this last generation, you and your iron dome. You know, there's mocking that's happening against Israel. And Israel in this position is seeing it and going, Oh God, we're your people. Don't let us be mocked and maligned by our enemies. Come and fight for us. And then uh the psalmist goes into Uh, This uh, analogy of this vine. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. It's talking about the Exodus. Why have you let this vine have have be broken, its walls be broken down, so that anyone that comes into this vineyard may pick its grapes? Even the boars from the forest ravage it, and insects from the fields. The idea is that Israel is this vineyard. It's supposed to be beautiful, well guarded, protected, producing you know great fruit, uh, you know lots of uh, grapes and and all that that comes from that and and of all that abundance and instead she's being ravaged because the antichrist is coming in and with all of the nations that are in alignment with him is just dealing such a a hardship to the land of Israel. She's weaker than she's ever been and she's crying out to God. That's really what we're looking at here in Psalm eighty. It's a cry to God to return. Oh, God, come back to us. Recognition that God has distanced himself from Israel. And that that really is a piece of the story. It's not the whole story, but it is part of what's happening in the end time drama. He's actually distancing himself in order that Israel would be awakened to her need for him. And so there's this, I mean, it is complicated. I mean, you know, all the reality TV shows about relationships the most challenging relationships to track is Israel and God, okay? I mean, this is, this is a very complex relationship with lots of he said, she said, said kind of stuff. And, and so here now is Israel is crying out, return to us, God Almighty. Re- return to us. Look from heaven and see what is happening right now. Watch over this vine, you brought us up out of Egypt. Here we are. You planted us in this land. Now look at what has come. The root at your right hand that has been planted. The sun that you've raised up for yourself. Come and help us. And then look in verse 16. It's just, it's the painful reality of what will occur in the Great Tribulation. And not only. I mean, this, is, this has been a psalm that has probably been very meaningful, heartfelt, and, and um, feeling very rev- relevant at various times in Israel's history. But in the final generation, it's going to be really intense. Verse 16, your vine is cut down. It's burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. The people of Israel perishing And the psalmist saying, it's at the rebuke of God that this is happening. The conditions are not merely the rage of Satan, evil men, and Israel's waywardness. It's God's involvement as the one who is rebuking Israel. And what is happening is, Israelis will be dying. I mean, that's what this means. Your vine is cut down, burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. I mean, I don't like the language, but it's inescapable. The Jewish people are being killed. It's horrifying. Next verse, verse 17. Now this is where we get kind of like uh, overtly messianic, all right, in this passage. We're just talking about let your hand rest on Israel, but then it says, let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you've raised up for yourself. That doesn't just say the son you've raised up for yourself. This now says the Son of Man. We're talking Ezekiel language. We're talking the language Jesus chose to use of himself. When Jesus was on the planet, what term did he use? He he did not refer to himself as the Christ. He referred to himself as Son of Man. But here it is, Psalm 80. 
Son of man is a messianic passage. It's a messianic promise. Psalm 80, verse 17. And here it is. The, the answer, because remember, all of Psalm 80 is about, oh, God, deliver us. We're in a hurt. Fix our problem. What is the solution? How will God fix the problem? He'll send the Messiah. He will send the Son of Man, the man at the right hand of God, the anointed one. The anointing that will rest on Jesus when he comes will be the answer to all the cries for deliverance up to this point. And Israel calls out for her to be revived and, and says this, then when you do this, when you send the Son of Man, when you send the Messiah and you bail us out, and you protect us, and you do the thing that we desperately needed because we were an inch away from death, when you do that, then we will not turn away from you. <laughs> that will be the last time we turn away. We won't do that anymore. Revive us, and we will call on your name. And the nation of Israel will give themselves fully to Jesus in the wake of all this. All right, well, Psalm 83, again, it's pretty much the same story. A little bit different language, but it's not so different language because it's still Asaph writing it, okay? So during the Great Tribulation, Israel prays for deliverance. But prays for deliverance in this passage from a 10-nation confederation that is attacking them on every side. It's interesting that this 10-nation alliance, this 10-nation confederation, finds its way into the language of the Psalms here in Psalm, 80, uh, Psalm 83. We'll get to see it. So this lament has had applications in all anti-Semitism. Anytime there's been anti-Semitism that's occurred throughout Israel's history from its neighbors specifically, this Psalm was applicable. But its fullness is found in the end-time drama. And just as a little point of reference, you can see partial fulfillments in the events of the Babylonian exile, the Assyrian exile, and also the destruction of uh, Jerusalem in 70 AD, but not the fullness, okay? So now, once again, I just want to remind us, we're reading the Word of God. There's, there's power on this, so as it's being read, you know, just kind of receive it, this psalm, all the ways that the Holy Spirit want to speak to you, even as it's being read. So now Psalm 83, 1 through 18. O oh God, do not remain silent. Do not turn a deaf ear. Do not stand aloof, O oh God. See how your enemies growl? How your foes rear their heads? With cunning they conspire against your people. They plot against those you cherish. Come, they say. Let us destroy them as a nation so that Israel's name is remembered no more. With one mind they plot together. They form an alliance against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, of Moab, the Hagarites, Byblos, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia, with the people of Tyre. Even Assyria has joined them to reinforce Lot's descendants. Do to them as you did to Midian, as you did to Sisera and Jabin at the river Kishon who perished at Endor and became like the dung on the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, who said, let us take possession of the pasture lands of God. Make them like tumbleweed, my God, like chaff before the wind, as fire consumes the forest or a flame sets the mountain ablaze, so pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. Cover their faces with shame, Lord, that they may seek your name. May they ever be ashamed and dismayed. May they perish in disgrace. Let them know that you, whose name is the Lord, that you alone are the most high over all the earth. All right, so Israel's cry for God to get involved. Oh, God, do not remain silent. Do not turn a deaf ear. Do not stand aloof. I mean, this, this is just really intense. I mean, this is, this is the cry of God who seems so far, who seems so distant, not paying attention. 
Don't turn a deaf ear. Like, are you even hearing? Don't remain silent. We keep asking, why aren't you moving? Do not stand aloof like you don't know what the situation is. This is really intense. It is a dire plea in the most dire time in Israel's history, which still awaits them. Israel's hanging on by a thread. This is horrific intent. Just who talks like this? Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation. Genocide. That they will not be remembered anymore. The name of Israel will not be remembered anymore because there won't be any more Israeli people on the planet to say, hey, we have a heritage, we have a history. This is intense. This is the exact heart of the Antichrist. This is what Hitler's heart was. My wife and I, we went and saw Bonhoeffer uh, maybe a week ago or something in that time frame and just got reminded of the, the unbelievable anger and pain and uh, hatred at just a level you can't even imagine that came from a person and a regime. And this is the heart cry of the Antichrist. Let us destroy them as a nation that their name is remembered no more. That is so intense. This horrific intent. But look at this 10-nation alliance thing. With one mind they plot together. If you count them, it's 10. If you look on a map, it's all their enemies. It's all the surrounding neighbors. It's really, really interesting. Now, I'll just say this. All the territory surrounding Israel is accounted for there. It says, it lists off 10 nations. Do I think those are the exact 10 nations as the 10 nations at the end of the age? No, but the territories probably, right? <laughs> because these don't all have modern, modern equivalent nations. There are nations around Israel, but it's not like a one for one. If you look at each of these nations that's listed off here that were ancient, ancient nations, Edom, Moab, <coughs> you know, all these were people groups and nations around Israel. So I don't think it's exactly a one for one, but I think that it makes sense that it, it would be that territory. Uh, that seems uh, very likely. And they're all Muslim nations at this point uh, that do not like Israel. Some of them tolerate Israel's existence. Some of the governments don't care as much about Israel. At least they're playing nice politically, some of them. But at the root, lots of people in those nations uh, you know, don't like Israel. And there's long-standing heated aggression uh, from those neighboring territories against Israel. So again, I think this is absolutely alluding to the 10-nation power at the end of the age. I just don't know that it's exactly the same 10 nations, but it's probably the same territory in general. So I know that's a little like, well, is it or isn't it? Hey, kind of both. Um, and who knows, the Lord may surprise us and the 10 nation alliance, maybe all the nations, I'm totally making this up. I don't think that this is going to happen, but this is the kind of thing that could happen. What if all the nations around Israel all group up and become three nations and now all of them, they just represent three. And then the Antichrist and goes, gets seven more, two in Europe and one in whereversville. I mean, you know, he, it could look anyway. But I do think that what's happening here is it does draw attention to the area around Israel will be the, the enemies of Israel and even to this whole 10-nation alliance thing. Uh, it says, let them form an alliance together, it says. Um, look here, though, at Revelation 17, because this is one of the passages that talks about the 10 nations. The 10 horns you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings with the beast. There's some language in there that makes me wonder, not only will these kings not have been kings a minute ago, but I wonder if maybe there's some shifting of territories where these kings came into power over a territory that wasn't considered a nation a minute ago. I, I don't know that to be true, but there's enough room in there to kind of wonder that based off the way that it's written. So anyway, there you go. Just a little, at least an allusion uh, to the, uh, or alluding to the um, uh, ten nation power at the end of the age. And now it says, treat our nations like you've done, or, I'm sorry, treat our enemies like you have to our enemies in the past. Do like you used to. Um, a, a verse that I've been praying often for Israel, as we pray around here for Israel often, is I've been praying Habakkuk 3.2 uh, lately. And Habakkuk 3.2 says, God 
rem- I remember your deeds of old. I remember what you've done for us in the past. Do those things again and show up big time for us. And here, the psalmist is crying out more or less the same thing, but he's asking specifically for judgments. He's saying, do crazy judgments like we've seen you do crazy judgments before. You remember the walls of Jericho? Do that kind of stuff. You remember the, you know, the, the time when you had the water fall down on Pharaoh and his guys? Do that kind of stuff. Well, the ones that he lists off specifically are Midian and the Canaanites. And just as a little, I don't know, this is a little side note, Israel was instructed to completely remove the Midianites and the Canaanites from the land. Uh, They were instructed specifically on those groups. And they didn't do it. And because they didn't do it, these two groups have been causing Israel problems ever since. And so just as a little like, what is our takeaway from that? When the Lord tells you to do something, do it. Do it fully. Don't argue. Go all the way. Because if you don't, there are natural consequences for your inaction, for your unwillingness, for your whatever, disobedience. There are natural consequences. So here, uh, the, the psalmist is going, hey, treat our current enemies who are doing us really dirty. Treat them like you did the leaders of Midian and the leaders of the Canaanites uh, in certain battles when, you know, we prevailed over them. Consume our enemies. It says this. This is to deal swiftly, and God will. There is coming a time. Remember, we just got done reading Psalm 80, and it talks about God's prescribed manner of justice. The way he's going to deal out justice, he's going to bring Jesus back, and the Son of Man is going to come in power. Well, here, we don't know it from Psalm 83, but we do know it from Psalm 80, Look how this is going to come about when God deals with it. Make them like tumbleweed, my God, like chaff before the wind, as fire consumes the forest or a flame sets the mountains ablaze. Jesus is going to come with that sort of power and the judgments that precede him and even go out before him. But it's not just uh, the, the fire language. Look, it's also the storm language, the storm of the Lord. We've talked a little bit about that before. This is, see the storm of the Lord. So pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. This is the storm of the Lord. I give you Jeremiah 30, verse 23, because it's another passage talking about end time Jesus coming and doing the mighty judgments. See, the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath a driving wind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. It's really interesting when you can have a storm that only hurts bad guys. Like, whenever a storm comes, my house gets as much rain as the next guy. You know, it's, it's that way. But this particular storm is strategic. This storm is like lightning precision, like strike there and not there. See, look at this. When your judgments, oh wait, no, I'm sorry, I skipped down. See, the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath. Okay, does that mean everybody's going to die? A driving wind that swirls down like individual tornadoes on the heads of the wicked. God is able to bring a swirling wind down. That one, that one, not that one, not that one, that one. (laughs) Which is such a picture of the way that the Lord is going to operate in the end times. There really is going to be God's ability to bring wrath on the wicked and to treat the righteous with a very different uh, measuring stick. All right, he's uh, calling out for the nations to be punished, but at the same time, for them to learn. I'm uh, likening this to Psalm, I'm sorry, to Isaiah 26.9. We'll read that here in just a second. And worship uh, team or worship leader, we're pretty close. You got maybe just another couple minutes here. Um. Look at this. Cover their faces with shame, Lord, so that they will seek your name. I'm going to read this next verse too so that you can kind of see it together. So that was verse 16. Verse 17 says, May they ever be ashamed and dismayed. May they perish in disgrace. Okay, just think about this. This is kind of interesting. Which is it? Cover their faces with shame, Lord, so that they'll seek your name. All right, do we want them ashamed or do we want them seeking you? Next verse. May they be ever ashamed and dismayed, May they perish in disgrace. Okay, well, do we want them ashamed or do we want them perishing? Do do we want them covered with shame or do we want them seeking your name? It's actually both, and here's how this works. 
Psalm 26, I'm sorry, Isaiah 26, verse 9. This is letter G. When your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the world learn righteousness. Not the dead people. The dead people are dead. The alive people went, oh my gosh, that guy's dead. How did that happen? God brought his judgments on the earth and the people that are remaining, the people that are living, they are now bearing testimony and they learn righteousness. So what God is going to do in all this is he's going to bring shame, utter uh, eternal punishment. He's going to bring you know, eternal dismay. May they ever be ashamed and dismayed. May they perish in disgrace. He's going to bring that on the wicked. But those that don't perish, because remember we've talked before about the survivors we talk about the ones that remain. The ones that remain, they're not going to be ashamed. They're going to have learned righteousness, and they will seek the Lord, all of them. All of those who remain will seek the Lord. The most glorious revival, in my opinion, while the revival at the end of the age will be greater in number than the revival in the millennium, the revival of the millennium has got to be the top-notch revival because there's never been a revival where 100% of humans got saved. But that one will. In the millennial kingdom, when Jesus has done all his mighty exploits, all 100% of humans will get saved. They will all learn righteousness because they will all just witness their neighbor, their enemies, their friends that you know went with the Antichrist. They'll have watched all of those wicked people die at the you know, workings of God in the midst of the end time drama. And they will have then seen the wisdom of God to do it. They'll have seen the kindness of God. They'll have seen his purposes towards Israel. And they will all get saved. So while I'm really looking forward to the end time revival that we're believing for, praying for, getting experience, that that number will be much higher. I mean, that number will be, some say a billion. I can believe for a billion souls in the great harvest at the end of the age. But I kind of think the revival in the millennium is cooler because you're now talking about 100% of humans that are left after all the wicked are executed, after all of the wicked die in the judgments, after Jesus you know, comes back and sets things up, 100% of them will give their lives to the Lord. It's pretty intense. And then this last uh, verse that we'll look at, let them know, this is the them is everybody, the whole planet. Let them know that you, whose name is the Lord, that you alone are the most high over all the earth. That all the earth statement is a really big one. Because again, the context here, the end time drama, the judgments of God, the second coming. And here's not since the flood, I've mentioned this before, but not since the flood has God shown himself to the whole planet in a way that the planet was able to perceive. Most of the planet didn't even know Jesus came the first time. But when Jesus comes the second time and in the preceding you know, years and, and time frame, God is going to make himself known as the one who is in charge, who is most high over all the earth. He's going to make himself known. Through his judgments, through his awesome deeds, he's going to shake the snow globe called planet Earth. And the whole Earth will see the glory of God and will know that he is the Lord. Father, we just thank you for your truth. We thank you for the word. And we ask you, God, for continued revelation. Would you help us as we study it? Give us grace, in Jesus' name. At this time, we're turning this room back into our prayer room. So you guys are welcome to hang around, welcome to have conversations. If you do, just